in the 1880s and 1890s, you really see the emergence of a new sort of journalism, particularly in New York, um, but not just in New York, um, that comes to be called yellow journalism. This is a pejorative term. I don't think either of you know, any of the participants of yellow journalism would see themselves as yellow journalists. That's what the other guy is. That's what the competitor is. But this is really kind of a new way to sell subscriptions to papers. There's this untapped resource. How do you get people to subscribe to your media? How do you get people to buy your paper versus someone else's paper? Uh, you go sensational. Uh, if it bleeds, it leads, right? So you see the, especially the Cuban situation as a great way not only to uh, highlight what these editors might think are uh, important political issues, important geopolitical issues, important foreign policy issues, but also, man, it's really sensational. Um, and there is violence. Um, there are ways that you can make it really uh, almost risque. Um, you, you know, so there's lots of talk about like how the Spanish treat the Cuban women uh, for example, and very strange to us, but for late 19th century, they're very provocative. You know, this is this is sensational stuff that you see printed in this newspaper. They reported some things that were happening. Of course, they, they exaggerated. Uh, they got a lot of their stories from Cuban insurrectionists who were trying to uh, you know, organize support for the insurgency. But of course, we've always had instances of this in the United States and other countries. Even today, we see uh, two sets of press facts uh, and people believing one set or the other. So it, 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 was, it was nothing new to have uh, the tabloids of that time exaggerating some of the facts that were happening. But to think that it was only the yellow press that motivated the U.S. to get involved. I think that is not true. There were other factors at play. Uh, 